Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Toffley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. As we record, it's the afternoon of July 24th, 2015. There is some kind of a tectonic shift underway in world affairs. Let's put the evidence on the table and see what we can conclude. Uh, the starting point of this, I would think, has got to be the double thank you or multiple thank yous coming from Obama to President Putin of Russia in the wake of the conclusion successfully now of the Iranian nuclear accord. That nuclear accord, by the way, has now been enacted into international law by a vote of the United Nations Security Council. And these reactionary Republican thugs, warmongers, neocons infesting the political process here have to be reminded that once it's through the Security Council, it's international law. And if you try to overthrow that, you become an international bandit. You become uh, a, uh, essentially a, an international uh, criminal. So that seems to be the ruling spirit of the Republican Party these days. Now, remember our perspective. The Republican Party must collapse first. Don't ever forget that. Hang on to that with both hands and your teeth. Now, let's see what we're getting from uh, Obama that might be uh, grounds for some cautious optimism. First of all, coming back uh, after the um, Iranian Accord, this is July 14th, 10 days ago right now, we have an interview with, uh, by, uh, with Obama by the, of course, the blowhard, ignoramus, Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, right? one of the most uh, overrated characters, but nevertheless, in this case, he's just a guy who brings a tape recorder. So here we have it. Asked if President Vladimir Putin of Russia was a help or a hindrance in concluding the deal, Obama said, Russia was a help on this. I'll be honest with you. I was not sure, given the strong influences, sorry, the strong differences we are having with Russia right now around Ukraine, whether this would sustain itself. Putin and the Russian government compartmentalized on this in a way that surprised me. And we would not have achieved this agreement had it not been for Russia's willingness to stick with us and the other P5 plus one members in insisting on a strong deal. Obama says, I was encouraged by the fact that Putin called me a couple of weeks ago and initiated the call to talk about Syria. And then Obama says, I think this part is, uh, is less uh, accurate. It's kind of a cover story. I think they get a sense that the Assad regime is losing a grip over greater and greater swaths of territory inside of Syria, right, to ISIS, backed by the West, and that the prospects of a Sunni jihadist takeover or rout of the Syrian regime is not imminent, but becomes a greater and greater threat by the day. That offers us an opportunity to have a serious conversation. So this is in the New York Times, July 14th, 2015. Uh, if you want to see a copy of it, send us a, an email, that is to say, taxwallstreetparty at gmail.com, taxwallstreetparty at gmail.com, and get a subscription to our excellent morning briefing. And this was in the morning briefing uh, this past week. But there's more. There's then the readout, um, a telephone call by um, Obama to uh, Putin, we think. At least it looks like the call was initiated uh, over here, um, the this is now Josh Ernst of the um, of the White House, the press office of the White House, uh, on the 15th of July, so nine days ago. Ernst says Obama had placed a call to President Putin, and here's the readout. The president spoke by phone today with President Vladimir Putin of the Russian Federation to discuss the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, reached among the P5 plus one, the European Union, and Iran regarding Iran's nuclear program. The president thanked President Putin for Russia's important role in achieving this 
milestone, the culmination of nearly 20 months of in, uh, in, uh, intense negotiations. They both affirmed, so Obama and Putin agree that the JCPOA represents an historic solution that will verifiably prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon by cutting off all the pathways to a bomb while ensuring the peaceful nature of Iran's program going forward. The two leaders, Obama and Putin, committed to remain in close cooperation as the JCPOA is operationalized and also expressed a desire to work together on reducing regional tensions, particularly in Syria. Uh, so that's very promising. No rocket rattling, no saber rattling, at least in these conversations. The stress on the positive, got to accentuate the positive. Now, the, uh, the, the, the uh, consequences of this, first of all, in TAS, the uh, t telegraph agency, uh, the uh, Russian Red uh, Federation official news service, uh, they report, the defense minister of the Donetsk People's Republic, these are our friends in Donetsk, they have ordered the withdrawal of light artillery, that is to say weapons of a caliber below 100 millimeters, to positions at least three kilometers from the front lines. Now, that would be uh, continuing the process mandated by Minsk II back in February was that heavy artillery, heavy weapons, Big tanks have to be pulled back several kilometers from the front lines. This is now a goodwill gesture from the defense minister of the Donetsk People's Republic saying, okay, we're not bound to do this, but we're happy to pull back our uh, lighter artillery up to 100 millimeters, right? 75 millimeter field guns and stuff like this. Uh, pull that back three kilometers from the front lines. So a um, very positive step there. Uh, notice also in the meantime, we'll talk about the economic uh, developments, that the economic bandwagon has been leaving the station. I think we also ought to, we ought to remind ourselves that in the week uh, previous to the conclusion of the U.S.-Iran nuclear accord, Putin had said, I believe in St. Petersburg, these sanctions are going to have to end. So that was a great encouragement, right? Get something for, for dismantling the sanctions regime from the U.S. point of view before it collapses uh, in front of you. So um, that's already some stuff, but now there's more. Um, we have a, a Lavrov-Kerry uh, colloquy dialogue where Kerry comes close to supporting the Russian call for a joint commission. This is on the one-year anniversary of the crash of the Malaysian MH17 airliner in Torres in Ukraine. A joint commission, in other words, not the one-sided, stacked propaganda exercise so dear to the hearts of people like the Prime Minister of Australia and similar characters, uh, but now uh, a joint, a serious uh, panel where points of view, not just the NATO point of view, are reflected. There is also the attempt inside Ukraine where we have uh, Poroshenko, our dear friend, President Poroshenko, is in the process of trying to tame the fascists of the right sector. And lo and behold, the U.S. ambassador says, yes, go ahead and disarm the right sector. Interesting. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Thursday of the 24th of July, 2015. So here are the things we can see. There's some kind of a rapprochement, some kind of a thaw, we can say, some kind of a charm offensive, even by Obama. And that is two uh, items on the 14th in the New York Times interview with blowhard Thomas Friedman. Obama thanks Putin and uh, expresses uh, his appreciation for the Russian role in getting this Iran deal wrapped up. Because remember, the Russians were a number one equal partners in this entire thing. And we've also then got this phone call 
where Obama thanks uh, Putin. Now, of course, Obama has since then has also called President Xi of China to thank him, and that's fine. Uh, I get the idea that that's a little bit of a camouflage in some ways, right? He's glad to do it. He's doubly glad to do it, not just to thank him, but because it maybe it makes the uh, the Putin business stand out a little bit less in the eyes of the fascistos of the Republican Party. Uh, Lavrov and Kerry seem to be agreeing that what is needed for the MH17 crash in Torres, Ukraine, one year after the fact, is a joint commission, a balanced uh, inquiry. And our dear friend Ambassador Piat, we've had some choice words for him in the past, but this time he's saying, sure, go ahead and pull the teeth of the fascistic right sector of Yarosh and company and uh, disarm them. So that would be something different than what they said at Maidan. Remember, then they said that, of course, the uh, the murder weapons used by right sector are sacrosanct. Now, this forms, this is already a big story in itself, and it's huge and worldwide. We've now got this other aspect, Turkey. Turkey is shifting. Erdogan, we've had some choice words for Erdogan here, too. He's the head of Turkey, and his... Now, Prime Minister Davutoglu, uh, we have been uh, battering away at them. Uh, something has changed, and it's going in the direction that we have been uh, demanding. Uh, earlier this week, uh, ISIS butchers killed uh, 32 people in Turkey. Some of them were Kurds, but this was on the ground in Turkey, a bombing by these fanatics. Uh, there's a separate incident where uh, the uh, ISIS fanatics attack the Turkish army on the whole, a very unwise course of action. So as of this morning, as of Friday, the 24th of July, the Turkish Air Force, which is considerable, has been bombing away at ISIS. Uh, and this is not a token stuff. This is pretty serious business. And... In addition to what the Turks can do for themselves, uh, a lot of air flights will be flying from the famous Injerlik Air Force Base, Injerlik, down there in southeast Anatolia, right? Southeast Turkey, close to Syria, close to the ISIS headquarters, Raqqa, places like this. Uh, this, if you want to do a bombing campaign, it makes it much easier. Up to now, the U.S. has not wanted to, uh, with the defeatists. And uh, appeasers like General Allen and General Dempsey. We're told that General Dempsey is now on his way out. We want General Allen out of there, too, the infamous U.S. ISIS czar who acts as the essentially the ISIS ambassador to Washington, D.C. Get him out. Send him back to retirement. Let him go amuse himself with Jill Kelly and his harem there in, uh, in Tampa, Florida. So uh, this is a big deal. Uh, so the entire Turkish government has shifted. They are uh, essentially taking into account what the opposition parties in Turkey, to their credit, have been demanding. The point is, this is Frankenstein's monster, right? You create ISIS, and he, he had a big role in creating it, did Erdogan. Well, then they're going to come after you, so you better, you better stop doing that. Now, uh, problems. Um, the obvious thing is that he wants to use this... He wants to bomb ISIS to some degree, use that as a cover to bomb the Kurds. This will not work and cannot be allowed, will be promptly denounced here. Then there's the, the other demands, right? Uh, Erdogan is still demanding a no-fly zone in northern Syria and a uh, essentially a buffer zone where refugees can gather. But one thinks also the Free Syrian Army and indeed uh, Nusra and some of the others, and, and ultimately ISIS also, right, if they just disguise themselves. So um, it's going to – there's also – we also have the fact that the ISIS control of the Turkish-Syrian border has been radically reduced. This is that famous 900-kilometer border, 500 miles. We were told that uh, originally ISIS had controlled – Four or five hundred kilometers of that border, which is where they get their sustenance. They couldn't live without it. Uh, ISIS has now been deprived 
of maybe three quarters or two thirds of the border crossings that they or non crossings that they have been uh, using. So this meshes with our demand. Remember, our demand is Saudis stop sending money, Gulf GCC stop sending money, and Turkey closed that border. So the border is getting to be a little bit more difficult for these ISIS butchers. Now, um, the other question, of course, is that Turkey with this is actually bombing Syria. If they should actually bomb Syrian government installations and Syrian assets loyal to Assad, that's a whole new ball game, and we will be on the alert for that. But as long as they're bombing ISIS, uh, that's self-defense, especially after these border incidents. So have at it, Erdogan. You're going to have to do some bombing in order to get rehabilitated here. But uh, you're, uh, for once, you're on the right track. Uh, if you shut down ISIS, uh, you're, you're actually in the best position to do it with minimal losses. Just cut off their logistics, and they will crumble. Now, all of this, of course, is a gain for Assad. Assad's, uh, in, in, in contrast to what Obama says or pretends to believe, I, Assad has now been uh, shored up by this, right, because you've now got the very effective Turkish forces coming in to plaster uh, ISIS, and this is what they, what they, what they need to have. And uh, we also want to see that word get back to the hinterland so the recruiting gets to be harder. Now, the other element that somehow fits into this, Saudi Arabia, after the visit of the great Ashton Carter, right, the new Secretary of Defense, Saudi Arabia now says, at least in public, that they will accept the U.S.-Iran nuclear deal. Hey, um, what they do behind the scenes, <laughs> who knows? But anyway, this is something. It means that Netanyahu is now severely isolated. The whole Gulf Cooperation Council is going to fall in behind the treaty. Netanyahu is alone. Maybe he will fall soon. We hope so. Back in a minute. Video 24th of July 2015 for uh, all of your world news needs and political marching orders. Go to toply.net, toply.net. You're going to have my Twitter feed, Webster G. Tarpley, and we are finding a way. We will be installing uh, a window so that you can get the Tax Wall Street Party daily briefing, to which I am a frequent contributor. That will also be available at Tarpley.net. So what a wealth of material. The original articles that appear there, the Twitter feed, the Tax Wall Street Party briefing, and, of course, this weekly broadcast and other uh, media appearances, right? Press TV of Iran and uh, and other international uh, places that are kind enough to invite me. So, um, the Saudis now accept the U.S.-Iran deal. Netanyahu is severely isolated. Also, look at these Republicans, right? They worship the Saudis. They worship that money. So, the Republicans are now fighting this wretched sabotage, rear guard fight. Uh, we had Kerry at the uh, Congress this week, and we saw Chairman Corker of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Boy, this guy is a corker. Uh, he's a real gutless wonder. Uh, and he tells Kerry, gosh, you've been, uh, you've been had, right? You've been taken. They bamboozled you. You've been duped. Uh, <laughs> and uh, similar verbiage. Uh, remember, little Rand Paul, little Rand Paul is uh, among the enemies of this deal, right? So little Rand Paul, the militarist, the warmonger, and everything I've ever said, a complete fraud, complete hypocrite, complete scoundrel, okay, from the southern jurisdiction, Scottish Rite Freemasons. And uh, maybe, you, maybe you've forgotten who he is because he doesn't get any attention now that Trump and his trumpery are on the scene. But that's the story, right? Rand Paul is as bad as any Republican warmonger. So just remember, there must never be another Republican president. Never, never, never. We'll do the, uh, we'll do the list at the end of the show if we get to it. Okay. Um, the United States, the United Nations Security Council, as I mentioned, has already enacted 
the deal into international law. So this is to some degree a, uh, a postscriptum. Notice the enemies of the deal have no arguments on the nuclear level, none. They were saying the overriding question is that Iran must never get nuclear weapons. Fine. They can't do anything with that. So now they've got to say, yeah, maybe they won't have nuclear weapons, but they're still very bad, and they fund terrorism, and then this entire cahier de doléances, right, this list of idiotic complaints. Well, uh, that's not getting anywhere either. But this is an important focus. Anytime you see your congressman or anything like that, vote for the Iran deal. All of you, vote for the Iran deal. No more wars. Sick of war. Look at your kids. You want them to die in the Middle East? No? Well, vote for the deal. Now then, uh, in the background of all this, uh, Obama goes to Kenya and Ethiopia. Uh, remember, uh, I was reporting uh, seven or eight years ago that Obama was an attempted U.S. gambit to um, restore the U.S. position in Africa against the Chinese. It hasn't really worked, has it? Uh, all the commentaries today stress that Obama has done less for Africa than George W. Bush, right? Bush the Younger, Mad Dog Bush the Younger, actually did some stuff about AIDS that had some effect. Uh, Obama just hasn't uh, done it. So the people at the Trilateral Commission, I'm sure, I'm sure Zbigniew Brzezinski is not happy about this, that his protege of uh, Iowa 2007-2008 has not done anything much to drive the Chinese out of uh, Africa. Um, I would say, though, uh, if you could refund the Export-Import Bank in the teeth of these libertarians and in the teeth of the loony left personified by Bernie Sanders, uh, the U.S. could do a campaign of uh, exporting high-technology capital goods to Africa, and that better happen soon. Now, um, let's look at some other aspects in the background on the Iran deal, tie up some of this stuff. The Iran deal is going to lead to a business bonanza, $185 billion of contracts are going to be forthcoming over the next year or two by Iran. The first to cash in is Germany, with the German delegation already there, already, uh, they've been there for days now. The head of this is Zygmar Gabriel. You'll remember he is the new Gustav Noske of the Social Democratic Party, a tormentor of Greece, but now he's going to bring home the bacon for the uh, German um, concern bosses. So that's $185 billion. Germany is already lining up. Germany is holding trade fairs. What's the U.S. doing? Nothing. Or better yet, we're, just, we're, ha we're having to deal with these troglodyte Republicans, these saboteurs of the state, right, the bankrateur, uh, the party of national sabotage, so that the U.S. is being deprived of any role in the $185 billion of contracts by these Republicans. Boy, is that a party. That's one to write home about. Now, of course, if you want to take advantage, what you're going to find is that the Germans have the so-called Hermes credits, export credit guarantees. The French have the so-called Crédit Cofacier, the Cofas, C-O-F-A-S, which is their program of export guarantees. And the U.S. as of now has... Nothing. The Export-Import Bank has not been renewed, and this is now a joint production of the crackpot uh, extreme right-wing House Republicans with this predator, this rodent, Henserling, and he gets support from Bernie Sanders because Bernie Sanders doesn't like big business. Now, this is about as asinine as anything can be. So it's um, uh, the, the, the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, right, largely controlled by Koch uh, and this woman, Véronique de Rougy. Véronique de Rougy, what is she? Is, is she working for COFAS? 
Is she is she working for the French, for the Chinese? How about Hensoling? Is he Chinese? Is he French? Uh, remember, under under Citizens United, foreign money can flow in, and man, it seems to be flowing. So you have Boeing, General Electric, Bechtel, Caterpillar, Applied Materials, uh, all kinds of companies, uh, and for these. Lunatics, right? This is the only system there is. You can make it work. It'll work quite well. Uh, Bernie does not offer the transitional program to socialism, but he, he intervenes uh, in favor of Wall Street because that's who's behind this. Wall Street says, we don't want to be taxed for that. Instead, we want to make the loans and we want to gouge the companies so that we can, we can have the U.S. companies being defeated overseas. So in the world of Bernie Sanders, there's no trade. But there is the F-35, of course. So this guy is the embodiment of the warfare state, in addition to being a leading sex theorist up in uh, Vermont. That's Bernie Sanders. That's a fraud. I'm sorry. That is a real horrendous fraud. Notice also how the modern Democratic Party relates to the Roosevelt New Deal. Clinton, the worst thing he ever did, one of the worst things he ever did, to destroy welfare. Well, welfare is the Social Security Act of 1935. How about Obama and his relation to the new frontier? Kennedy went to the moon and or started to, the process. Obama destroyed the manned space program. We're still trying to rebuild it. So Bernie Sanders in the great tradition, Franklin D. Roosevelt created the Export-Import Bank 80 years ago. And Bernie Sanders votes to destroy it. I'm sorry. We'll be back in a minute. So, look, uh, the Iran deal, it's going to free up a lot of oil. It's going to free up $185 billion in development contracts. This is the royal road to the future of humanity. But the U.S. so far is not even competing. Germany is already there. Where's the U.S.? Well, everybody's still fighting in the Senate, right, where we've got people like Corker and McCain and assorted Republican warmongers. And we've even got Menendez, right, indicted, but still there uh, among the uh, Democratic warmongers. So we have lots of warmongers who seem to want to go down the road of yet another cat catastrophic war while the rest of the world is getting down to business and world economic development. This is the doom of the United States. It's very clear. The U.S. will be doomed unless this rotten, bankrupt ruling class is ousted and replaced. That's how we have to reform them. The Export-Import Bank would be the leading edge of cashing in on some of those Iranian contracts. But we can't do it because of the Republicans, the libertarians, so-called, right, brought over here by Rockefeller, David, paid for by Koch at the, the original Cato Institute, and so forth. Libertarians are the plague, they're the pestilence of society. And we're seeing it right now. The Export-Import Bank needs to be increased, not cut, to keep up with China and these other uh, international competitors. And Bernie Sanders, I'm sorry, Bernie joined the loony left when he uh, voted for the non-renewal uh, of the Export-Import Bank. Now, let's talk about another related topic, the highway bill. This ought to be about $50 billion in highway construction repair funds. And uh, the deadline is July 31st. So if this doesn't get passed by August 1st, we're going to have a whole bunch of construction sites that shut down, and the preparation for future construction is going to shut down. You know the story. The highway bill is funded by the gas tax at 18.4 cents per gallon. We don't like that tax. It's a regressive tax. Uh, we know that from the American Society of Civil Engineers that the, the roads are bad. They even tell you that the bad roads cost the country $101 billion a year. So now here comes a bipartisan sellout. Oh, you independents, you fussy independents, you, you're going to like this one. Senator Boxer of California, a typical right-wing Democrat, right, another enemy of the New Deal, anti-labor, and now you'll see, anti-retiree. She wants to cut. Social Security, she wants to attack Social Security in order to get some money. She's scrounging together money. So she says, let's 
gouge some money out of the Social Security Disability Fund. This is it's absolutely grotesque, as I'll hear you'll hear in just a minute. But the disability fund. So she says we got to make sure that if you're a fugitive felon, you can't claim a Social Security check. Senator, did you ever think that there might be an, in, an innocent family involved? You're not going to convict the wife. You're not going to convict the baby or the little kids. And nevertheless, you want to make them suffer because you, boxer, are a gutless wonder. You're a Wall Street Democrat. You stink. You won't fight for the Wall Street sales tax because that's the answer here. The Wall Street sales tax forces Wall Street to finally pay some kind of tax of any kind at all, and it ought to be earmarked, among other things, for saving of Social Security. Now, the, the thing that makes this even more grotesque is that as of this morning, we have the report from the Social Security trustees, uh, the people that oversee the entire Social Security program, and they tell us, that, uh, well, there is one good thing, which is that the overall Social Security, the retirement benefit, uh, is now going to last until 2030. You know, but Social Security, as presently constituted, will pay full benefits up to 2030. So don't let any of those Republican demagogue thug candidates try to scare you on that point, unless, of course, they carve it, which is now what, what Boxer is proposing to do. That's the retirement fund. So after, um, I'm sorry, it's actually 2035. So the Social Security Retirement Fund has enough money to pay full benefits until 2035, at which point it would drop. Now, you can do obvious things, right? You can, you can remove the cap. So all income, all wage income, all earned income is taxed on Social Security tax. That would be easy. Even easier, the Wall Street sales tax. 1% tax on all turnover, stocks, bonds, derivatives, all the rest of it. One half to the feds, one half to the states. Uh, remember, Wall Street pays no taxes. They're like the nobility in France before the French Revolution. They don't pay taxes. Goldman Sachs pays 1% or 2%. General Electric, in the hedge fund essence that it is, although they're trying to change it, we'll believe that when we see it. Uh, General Electric actually has a negative tax rate. They get back. Uh, more than they've ever uh, put in under withholding. But the bad news is that the Social Security Dis Disability Fund is going to be hurting. We're talking about an average monthly benefit for disabled workers and their families of about $1,000 a month. That's, uh, that sounds it's comparable to Greece, okay? So 11 million people are getting Social Security Disability. And this is going to come next year already, next year, 2016, right in the middle of a presidential race. This might be the hand of divine providence, right, to skewer those austerity ghouls in both parties that want to roll this back. So we're told that the Disability Trust Fund will run out of money in late 2016. That would trigger an automatic 19% cut in benefits. So you go down from 1000 to 800 Minus 193 a month, precisely. Now, people know why this is, right? We have so many unemployed people. These uh, wretched vermin in the Congress uh, refuse to fund the unemployment benefits at a, a reasonable rate. So more and more people facing a future of no job are attempting to get themselves onto the Social Security disability fund, and uh, that's perfectly understandable. You don't want to punish them. You don't, want to, you don't want to find savings inside that program like Crazy Boxer. Rather, we wish to make Wall Street pay. Wall Street zombie banks, Wall Street hedge fund hyenas, they've got to pay. So there's our answer to that one. Uh, notice Little Rand Paul, once again, little Rand, this, he's born with a, a silver spoon, I'm sorry, a golden spoon in his mouth, right? The senator from Aquabuda, you know him. He said earlier this year, people who are getting on to Social Security disability benefits are slackers. They're, they're 
welfare queens, right? You get the idea. So uh, <laughs> this uh, character, uh, he says, half the people getting benefits are either scared or their back hurts. So he's trying to mock this entire thing, right? Mock the suffering of working people from the standpoint of the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite Freemasonry. So that guy must never be president, let me tell you. Oh, and Rand's little, his, uh, we're, we're always intrigued by his slogan, defeat the washing machine. Isn't that it? Defeat the washing machine. Oh, I'm being told from the control room it's defeat the Washington machine. I'm sorry. I thought it was defeat the washing machine. And he wanted, uh, I don't know what he wanted. And I don't think he knows. So that's um, the situation. The Export-Import Bank has to be funded. The Highway Bill has to be funded. And the Social Security Disability Fund has to be funded. The basic means of this is the... Wall Street sales tax of 1% with hundreds of billions of dollars of likely income. Back in a minute. Welcome to the second hour of World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. on the sultry afternoon of the 24th of July. We had some um, interesting temperatures this week, but not enough to accredit the global warming hoax. I'm sorry. The medieval warm period was warmer. But now, the background of all of these events, right? Will there be a breakdown crisis, a new panic in the world financial system? And this remains uh, possible. Uh, doesn't mean that you should give all your money to Stansbury, like the Paul Tards are arguing, right? We know that Ron Paul is now a salesman for Stansbury, and I'm wondering whether he'll be joined by Little Rand. Maybe Little Rand will make a... Uh, a speech on the floor of the Senate endorsing Stansbury, right? This is a this would get to be a new area, right? A gray area. Is that legal? What are they going to do? Um, Ukraine. We had a report last Saturday from the London Financial Times that Ukraine was going to go bankrupt as early as today, Friday, the twenty fourth of July, right? That Ukraine might blow. Well, as it turns out, just in the nick of time, the Ukraine government, the Ukraine fascist clique, I guess as we would call them, uh, with this uh, Jaresko, right, this charming uh, gun mall from, from uh, uh, Chicago, they paid $120 million, uh in international financial debts. Uh, this, of course, was made possible by the friendly European Commission, which uh, sent Kiev 600 million euros a couple of days before this week uh, to make sure they could make some of these payments, right, so that they wouldn't go bankrupt on Friday. And, you know, we've, we've heard from the International Monetary Fund, Lagarde, uh, she has said, look, you know, we can, we can keep funneling money to Ukraine even if they go bankrupt and start defaulting on everything. We can still pay them. We can, we can pay into their arrears. <laughs> so um, that's Lagarde. Lagarde. And uh, $70 billion of debt uh, is still hanging over Kiev. Their GDP has gone down by 9 or 10 percent this year. Their inflation is running at 46%. This is the work of uh, Yats, right? Uh, Yatsenyuk. Uh, but now, in the third quarter and the fourth quarter, in the rest of 2015, Kiev will have to pay out about $5 billion, and that's not going to be easy. And whether the Eurogarchs will want to foot the bill, this is anybody's guess. Notice that the... IMF board, International Monetary Fund board, will meet on Ukraine on the 31st of July. So right now, that remains on the brink. And it could, uh, of course, um, become a, uh, an out-of-control crisis at any point. Uh, Jaresko seems to be concentrating on extorting this Franklin Templeton group uh, who want their money, of course, um, but with evil doing good in this case uh, on the part of them, uh, Jaresko is uh, trying to get them to uh, to give up a large part of what they've uh, what they've got. All right. Now, in the world of science, 
we're supporting science here in a world which uh, the Western world, the U.S. world, seems to have turned against it, right? Science, technology, industry, progress. Those are the ingredients in the rising standard of living and improved longevity of humanity over the past centuries, couple of centuries, I guess. We've just had the, the Pluto flyby, right? We want to celebrate that. Um, mountains of water ice, frozen water ice, but not methane ice or some other kind of ice, but water ice on Pluto uh, indicating the presence of water, right? And therefore maybe of life at some point in the past, whatever. That's the Pluto flyby. The U.S. Uh, riding on the initiatives of people like Kennedy, the U.S. has now visited all ten key objects, right, including the sun and the moon, but the uh, the planets, right, all the planets, the sun and the moon. Now, um, we've also got NASA in the last couple of days pointing to a newly discovered planet at the distance of 1,200 light years, a new planet which seems to resemble Earth and which might, therefore, uh, be the site of some kind of intelligent life, 1,200 light years away. If you send them a message today, they're going to get it in 1,200 years, right, if you send an uh, electromagnetic uh, signal. But still, uh, this is highly interesting. Also notice, uh, malaria, right, thanks to Rachel Carson and her genocidal book, Silent Spring, the abolition of DDT has killed, what, 100 million people in the third world? Something approaching that. Well, at least now there is a anti-malarial vaccine, which is one-third effective. In other words, if you give everybody a shot, it means that one-third of the people will be permanently protected. Well, that's not perfect, but you've got to take it. And I think the going price for each shot is about $5, right? A trifle, but of course in Africa, that's uh, the income for a week, uh, and it gets bad. We've also got uh, Eli Lilly, a company that we're not prepared to endorse, but nevertheless, gold is where you find it. They have an anti-Alzheimer's disease uh, prevention, Solanezumab, Solanezumab. That's the uh, Eli Lilly anti-Alzheimer's. So uh, scientific and technological progress uh, goes on. Let's now jump over to the presidential contest and maybe some U.S. domestic uh, politics. Trump and McCain. Donald Trump. Okay. Donald Trump we hasten to point out at the beginning, is a racist. He is a scoundrel, uh, but he's a rogue in a way that uh, can be entertaining up to a point. Although you've got to remember that if that entertaining stuff goes on too long, you will pay a very high price. And what I mean by that is Trump in power would most likely be worse than any of the Republican competitors uh, to Trump, simply because he's mentally unstable, he's a narcissist, he's a, the worst narcissist we've seen in recent years. But the one public service we're getting from Trump, and we stress here that this is this Leibnizian universe that we're in, evil does good in spite of itself. If it hadn't been for that, we would have been out of business long ago. Uh, Trump is acting as a wrecking ball for this hated, obsolete, toxic Republican Party, right? The, the party of bigots, the party of xenophobes, the party of austerity ghouls, of warmongers, snobs, up and down the line. So he is hastening the doom of the Republican Party. The Republican Party needs to go into the garbage can of history, and Trump is acting as garbage man, sanitary engineer, in this uh, case, simply by the fact, as many have noted, he says blatantly, openly, brutally, cynically, what so many 
Republicans actually uh, believe. But some people would say, no, no, but it's so entertaining, right, to see these pompous parliamentary cretins, right, to see McCain confronted and hauled up. Sure, uh, that is uh, diverting, right? That's, um, for the moment, it seems to be intriguing. You just have to remember something like the young Mussolini, um, especially if you limit it to an attack on the democratic, you know, parliament. The parliament is the source of everything. You make fun of them. That's going to lead you in a very bad direction. the young Mussolini. Back in a minute. Welcome back to the World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. We're very glad now to be joined by the most prominent political prisoner in the United States. That's Reverend Edward Pinckney speaking to us from the jail. Rick Snyder, Governor Rick Snyder's uh, atrocious jail in Cold Coldwater, uh, Michigan. So welcome, Reverend. Webster, 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 I tell you, it's, it's a privilege and honor to be on your show once again. Matter of fact, I look forward to being on your show because it's the only thing I get relaxation is talking <laughs> to and talking to your audience. And I, I, I tell you, just being here is, is a real challenge. Webster, I, I have to confess that uh, uh, there, there have been some real major issues inside this, this place that, you know, but you anticipate stuff like this happening and from different angles and from different people. But uh uh I you know, we we had several, several incidents, uh confrontations, you name it, we have had it. But we we're staying focused and trying to do what we need to do. So that's the most important thing I can I can tell you. Uh I, I was in, in the law library today uh, trying to figure out how we're going to deal with some of these issues that we have right here. Even though my issue is, is right now is very, very important because it's right there on the table, uh, I'm looking forward to, to hearing them say that you are going to have a hearing on the, I'm, I'm going to look at, I'm going to say August the 10th. I'm just going to throw that out there. And, um, and I believe by that time I should be on my way home and be able to talk to you on my very, very own telephone. So, Reverend, Webster, is I, that that's in that's in Berrien County, right? That's in St. That Joseph, is Michigan. Barron County. The hearing will be in Barron County, Michigan. And uh, as much as I hate to even go down there and deal with these people at this level, being behind bars, but I wasn't behind bars, I wouldn't mind going down there and dealing with them. Matter of fact, it would be my pleasure to deal with them. But right now, they they got the noose around my neck, and and uh, I have to figure out a way how I'm going to cut this rope. So um, I'm just doing what needs to be done, Webster, and I'm staying focused. I'm not getting sidetracked, and I'm facing reality here because it is, you know, what we're up against. Uh, uh, these corporations once again trying to take over and show their power. They're letting you know that we're in control whether you like it or not, until the people rise up and say no more, it's going to continue on this level. And Whirlpool, it's just, it's just the beginning. You know, people don't understand General Motors, Fox, I mean Ford and all these other great Fox too. You know, these are the people that, that we have to come back. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good right now, Webster. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm very determined to, to deal with this thing. On Monday, it, uh, it'll be, I'll be three weeks inside the uh, Court of Appeals. And um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at five weeks. That's, that's what I'm looking at at the most. So let's look forward to me talking to you from my home on this phone and doing the show. So that's how, I'm, that's how I'm dealing with If you have any specific questions that you want to ask me, please do not hesitate because most likely I do have the answer. We, we undoubtedly have to make uh, a fundraising appeal, right? The fact that these um, the, the expenses for the appeal um, are, are considerable. So we've got to direct people to bhbanco.org, right? Uh, Benton correct. Harbor, BH. Black Autonomy Network of Community Organizations dot org. So bhbanco dot org. On the right hand side, scroll down a little bit. There's a PayPal, and you can make a uh, contribution, which I urge people to do. So this uh, this you know goes on, and that we have you know plenty of the bills that have built up. So please give generously. Absolutely, and, you know, and that's amazing. And one of the things I have discovered since I've been here. 
is that uh, how the the people inside, uh, the people who actually work here, and how they're taking advantage of the taxpayers. See, this is what people don't quite understand. Even this phone call, you know, which is very, very expensive, basically only costs, listen to this, the, the phone company is only charging 3%, three, three pennies per minute. But they're charging us about 25 to 30 cents per minute per call. And uh, when you think about that, when you talk about uh, 10 minutes is, is uh, $3, and then you talk about 450 per call for a 15-minute call, you're talking about something that's big because it's, it's not that the phone company is charging this amount of money. It's the prison system. They get a kickback on everything you think of. They got We got a JPEG here where you can just send an email to me. If you send an email to me, it's 20 cents. And if I send one back, it's another 20 cents. And it goes on and on and on where they get kickbacks on just like everything you, you could think of. If you if you go to, if you buy candy, if you buy popcorn, uh, they, the, the kickback is so tremendous that, you know, they get the, the kickback and they use that money any way they want to. And uh, 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 think about the health care here. They're double dipping so much. And what they're doing, they're, they're sucking the life out of the, the taxpayers. That's who that's who, who, who really lose it, and, and the prisoners themselves. Even though we get uh, 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 services that nobody would ever for health care, you 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 know, if you have a toothache, they give you an aspirin. Okay, if you if you, if your arm is hurting, they give you an aspirin. Your stomach's hurting, they give you an aspirin. Then they charge you five dollars per aspirin. So. This is what they do, and you have to pay, whether you like it or not. If you ever get any money from your family members, they take that money first. That's how they deal with this. And they are making a profit as, that you would not believe. Also, because of the food is so bad and stuff like that, they are really, really taking advantage of the situation and the taxpayers, and they're showing people what they can do and how they can do it, and there's nothing you can do about it. Because everybody wants the prisoners, once you get them locked up, they want to keep them locked up and throw away the key. No matter what. Reverend, um, last last week you you noted that the Aramark Corporation is not going to be providing the uh, this food service, if you can call it that, and it's going to be Trinity, the Trinity Food Services coming in. So, in our morning briefing for Thursday, July twenty third, right yesterday. Yeah. Uh, the Tax Wall Street Party did uh, an, uh, a, a profile of uh, Trinity, and I guess uh-huh. you've already seen this, right? That Trinity is as bad or worse than uh, Aramark, uh, and this was a no-bid contract, right? In other words, yes. Snyder let them in, and uh, you know we, we've got all the details on how rotten this contract is and how the whole process thinks, but then we've got... Newspaper clippings from Georgia, from North Carolina, from Ohio, Arizona, and Maryland with all uh, terrible things done by Trinity, right? Uh, all kinds of uh, violations. So we're, we're out there exposing them, uh, and we'll continue to do so. So we'll see you next week, Reverend. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So we were talking about the... Uh, the feud between the Donald, Trump the Frump, and McCain, Walnuts. Uh, and we're trying to point out that uh, although the antics of Trump are entertaining, if he ever got any power, you would rue the day. So don't, be, don't kid yourself about that. This is an unstable, narcissistic personality. Now, notice also that... Um, the Republican Party uh, is after Trump. This is actually an interesting moment. The entire collection of Republican candidates, these boring, bungling, sleazy clowns, but austerity ghouls and austerity vampires, every one of them, uh, they're falling flat. The American people are not interested, right? Better the clown show. Better, the, better this uh, character from the Hippodrome. Trump, right? You're fired. Right? All this stuff, right? Better, better, uh, a kind of a Beppe Grillo figure, um, a would-be comedian, or 
reality show star. It is an indictment on the insipid ruling class, right? Why? And it also shows the, the critical role of the media, right? They're indignant that Trump mocks McCain, derides him, and so forth. Same thing with Rick Perry. Rick Perry, so stupid, such a moron, that he couldn't even remember the executive departments that he was proposing to smash up. So throwing hundreds of thousands of people out of work and creating huge unmet needs for services. Uh, that's Rick Perry. So he's the one leading the charge against Trump. So we welcome Trump in this very narrow sense. He's the wrecking ball of the Democratic, of, of the Republican Party. Trump is the wrecking ball of the Republican Party. But let's think of him something like Samson amongst the Philistines. Samson can push the columns and bring the Philistine temple down on all the Republican Philistines, but also on himself. So we wrap them all up in a nice package and send them into the garbage can of history. That, I think, is Trump, whatever he thinks he's doing. Remember, there is the cunning of reason. Right? People like this sometimes do good things far beyond their power to even imagine. So, again, welcome to Trump, wrecking ball of the Republican Party, grave digger of the Republican Party, but destined to be wrapped up in that package headed for oblivion. Now, here's the other thing with McCain, right? You know our line on McCain. He went to Syria in the spring, I think it's April of 2013, and he met with Baghdadi, the current caliph of the uh, uh, ISIS, right, the Islamic State, this butcher, mass murderer. He also met the cannibal, the guy who was put on uh, film, eating the heart and lung of his slain enemy, and, of course, the kidnapper, the guy who got McCain into trouble because – that allowed the families of the Shiite pilgrims who were being held by these terrorists, right? the Northern Storm Brigade, it called itself at that time, of the Free Syrian Army. Uh, McCain cavorts with them. So McCain qualifies as a terrorist controller, as a terrorist controller, cavorting with the caliph, the kidnapper, and the cannibal. Okay, now, here's the other thing about McCain. Uh, the, the, the question of the prisoner of war missing in action U.S. troops from Vietnam especially, POW, MIA. I want to appeal to people to understand, you think this is a right-wing issue. It is not. This is a real issue, and it shows, once again, the criminality of people like Nixon and Ford and Kissinger and McCain. So the idea here is when – the Nixon administration, led by Kissinger in this case, uh, came to the Paris Accords of January 27, 1973, ending uh, the U.S. role in the Vietnam War. There were a couple of thousand U.S. prisoners of war that were being held by the North Vietnamese, right? The Hanoi government had these prisoners. Some of them were airmen like McCain, others captured on the ground. And they were all supposed to be brought home. However, the Vietnamese uh, wanted reparations. They wanted re rebuilding assistance for their bombed-out country. As in the French experience in Indochina, the French had uh, made peace, and the Vietnamese did the same thing. They kept a certain number of French troops and used them as bargaining chips. So the Vietnamese did the same thing. So Nixon and Kissinger, and then later Ford and Kissinger, knew that there were indeed Americans that were being held in Vietnam. And they didn't want this to become an issue. They didn't want to have to go to the Congress and say, we want two or three billion or five billion for Hanoi, and then we'll finally get these troops back, right? That would have been politically very embarrassing for the wretched Republican Party even then. So they preferred, Nixon and Kissinger, preferred to hide this fact. Now, of course, there were these listening devices, right? They're like um, microphones to some extent, right? The sensors that were used to track the Ho Chi Minh Trail, right? The principal logistics uh, artery leading from uh, North Vietnam across uh, 
Laos and Cambodia sometimes, and then into uh, South Vietnam. Th- those uh, areas have recorded that people would punch in identification numbers of missing U.S. troops, meaning 99.99% probability that those were those, uh, some of those uh, American soldiers who had maybe escaped from a prison camp, right, and were out there trying to get assistance. And the goal of the State Department was to shut this up. But when you've seen that Rambo movie, how the State Department guy aborts the um, the mission, this is uh, actually somewhat realistic. So what's the role of McCain? Is that when the bereaved or grieving families came and said, look, we, we think we've uh, lost our son, but we think he might also be a missing in action. We'd like to find out. McCain was the attack dog. He was taken out there to rave and rage and and, uh, try to intimidate and discredit the organizations and people that were trying to do something for their relatives. They, They suspected that they had been deliberately left behind, and they were right. So McCain is hated among veterans, hated among anybody who knows anything about the POW MIA situation. I would refer you to... Uh, a, a useful summary article by Sidney Shanberg. So this is a leftist. So Sidney Shanberg of the Nation Institute. Again, leftists, not right-wing kooks, but these are leftists, and it's documented uh, with the hearings, with the various quotes, right? Uh, Melvin Laird, U.S. Secretary of Defense, James R. Schlesinger, U.S. Secretary of Defense, said they believed that U.S. forces had been left behind in Vietnam. So this is uh, McCain's track record. Therefore, our demand remains, arrest McCain for ISIS. Hashtag, arrest McCain for ISIS. He's a terrorist controller, and get him out of there. Now, um, let's see some other interesting uh, questions here. Uh, I guess we we have some some uh, interesting uh, sort of domestic politics uh, elements. Let's start uh, here in the Washington suburbs. Uh, good old Ike Leggett, uh, Isaiah Leggett, the county executive of Montgomery County, Maryland, has announced that the statue of the Confederate soldier outside the courthouse is going to be moved away. Imagine you're black and you go in the Montgomery County courthouse and there's a there's a statue that says to the Confederate veterans of Montgomery County. Nobody else, just them. Not much justice to be had there. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C., the 24th of uh, July. How fast the uh, the time goes. Let's just say in passing, we express our solidarity with the French farmers. Right? Nous déclarons la solidarité totale avec la lutte des paysans français contre les néolibéraux de la Commission européenne, la maudite Commission européenne. So we're supporting the French farmers against the neoliberals who have taken down the price supports, wherefore worldwide parity price can be done. Um, and uh, these 600 million euros, that's, that's not going to do it. That's the... Uh, the Hollande Val uh, method. Let's just look now. Um, we've got this collection once again of boring, bungling clowns, the candidates for the presidency, right? And we've seen that uh, the Democratic Party, of course, is loaded with uh, with people who uh, should not be in public office, right? Be it Bernie. Sanders with his attack on the Export-Import Bank, Barbara Boxer, who wants to loot Social Security disability. Let's just go through the list. We're now up to 16 Republicans. So we've got Trump. We've talked about him. He's a racist. He would govern worse than the people that you see. And uh, his principal positive function is to be a wrecking ball. Then we've got Jeb Bush. Well, uh, I have uh, some choice references to Jeb Bush as part of the Iran-Contra gun-running and drug-running operations. That's from my Bush book of 1992, when Jeb was the 
the, sec- the Secretary of Commerce of Florida and the head of the uh, Dade County uh, Republican Party. So we've got Trump and we've got Jeb. Now, Walker, Governor Walker of Wisconsin has proven his mettle as a strike breaker and therefore is rolling in catch dough. However, he's also a moron. <laughs> As you can see, and his uh, his countenance displays uh, a certain uh, what can we say bewilderment by the by the modern world. So he's a thug, but he may not be the thug they need. Kasich just came out this week. Now the Kasich you see is a born again Kasich. You know, he went through something like a nervous breakdown after he lost that union busting referendum in November of 2011. Look at the tax Wall Street party. Uh, briefing about that earlier this week. And remember, if you want a subscription, taxwallstreetparty at gmail.com. I'm taxwallstreetparty at gmail.com. Just say, sign me up. I want a sub. Kasich has now learned the stealth method of union busting. However, I suspect, like Nero, right? Uh, Nero, the Emperor Nero, was considered to be a model uh, pupil uh, for Burris, his uh, his tutor, except then when Nero got into power, he went wild and started killing everybody around him. I think that's Kasich. He would try again to earn the Koch money for the re-election campaign by busting every union in the country. And then there's the other argument, which is that you need a union buster to be sure, but you've above all got to get one who can play that role on television. And that is Christie. Make no mistake, he's not out of it. Jeb Bush and the CIA Bush uh, think they've knocked Christie out of it, but maybe they haven't. Then we've got the famous moron Rick Perry, so dumb he thinks secessionism is a viable option, can't even remember the names of the executive departments that he wants to smash. Pathetic. And, of course, Texas in the cellar in every one except where they're edged out by Mississippi, Alabama, or Arkansas, right, in terms of infant mortality and the rest. Santorum, we, he's not of the saints. We call him Diabolorum because he's of the devils. Now, this is a, a kind of uh, somewhat softer fascism than the uh, the main brand that you uh, you hear about. This is the Franco, Francisco Franco of Spain or Marshal Pétain of France. It's a somewhat softer version of fascism, but that's him. Huckabee, Uh, a religious fanatic, uh, someone who wants to uh, impose the the dictates of the Old Testament, I guess, on uh, modern life. Can't be done. Carly Fiorina destroyed the company Hewlett-Packard. She was such a failure that the board of directors had to tell her to quit, ask her to get lost. That's a successful businesswoman. Then we have Lindsey Graham. A warmonger, uh, the great amigo of John McCain, right? It used to be McCain, Graham, and Lieberman. Today, it's not quite as successful, but it's McCain, Graham, and Kelly Ayat of New Hampshire. Uh, he's a warmonger. And the other thing about him is uh, he's a bachelor. Now, I have to cite what, uh, what Senator Kirk of Illinois, Republican Senator Kirk said that Graham is a bro with no hoe. Well, uh, how shocking, but uh, there it is. You make of that what you can, and please don't blame me. That was from the Senate, uh, Senator Kirk. Bobby Jindal rhymes with swindle. Uh, as you know, if you've been reading our daily briefing, subscription at taxwallstreetparty at uh, gmail.com, Jindal has essentially destroyed the public school system in Louisiana with vouchers and other dirty tricks. Pataki of New York. Well, the the, the, uh, cliché used to be the failed governor of a small southern state. Pataki wants to reform that view. He wants to be the nominee as the failed governor of a large northern state. That's Pataki. Uh, and you can look in the record for that. Carson, the mad scientist, right? He says that Obamacare is like the Nazi regime in Germany. Uh, this is somebody who ought to be uh, in the nerve clinic. Uh, he should be in the psychiatric clinic. Rubio, uh, senator from Gusanos, this guy 
may be what we've called a crypto Mormon. In other words, he was a Mormon for a while. He may actually be the vehicle for that Mitt Romney machine. That might be the thing that's holding him up. Ted Cruz, uh, one of the most uh, impudent demagogues uh, of recent years, right? Sure, access to the dark places of the American psyche. Uh, and, uh, well, his clowning, I think, has already made him known. And who's left? Of course, Little Rand. Little Rand is so desperate for attention. He's getting nowhere. He was supposed to be the Pex bad boy of the campaign. He's getting no attention. It's all going to Trump. So Little Rand, in desperation this week, tried to do a publicity stunt, as it used to be called. He brought out piles of paper. He said that was the tax code. And then he showed that he could cut them with a chainsaw, that he could burn them, or he could throw them into a, a wood chipper, a kind of a shredder for, uh, for branches and things like this. Uh, so that's him. Remember, he's the one who says that if you're on Social Security disability benefits, you're a slacker. You're goofing off. You're a parasite. Parasite? He knows all about being a parasite. And remember the slogan, defeat the washing machine. That's uh, Rand Paul. Hillary Clinton. Well, <laughs> we've talked about her. Uh, the great tradition of Bill Clinton in the year 2000, he deregulated derivatives. He destroyed, uh, a couple of years earlier, destroyed the, uh, the welfare system left over from 1935. That's Hillary. Bernie Sanders, no export-import bank, but lots of F-35 fighters. Uh, a, a very bad choice. Jim Webb, the Scotch-Irish uh, attack dog who uh, essentially runs on a, a kind of a strange platform of his own moral superiority and um, vague slogans about uh, what is moral rectitude. Anyway, very much pulling his own home. How about Lincoln Chafee of Rhode Island, a somewhat vacant wasp uh, who's out there? Um, Martin O'Malley of Maryland uh, in some ways might be – the least reprehensible of this group. We have to think about O'Malley's political skills. O'Malley is the father of the rain tax, which has now installed the Republican uh, gangster Hogan as governor of Maryland. That's thanks to O'Malley's tax. So we wish you a good weekend, and we'll be back next week on the World Radio.